Pokemon has been out for just over one week and it's safe to say I'm obsessed. And from the looks of the sale figures and all the comments, it looks like a lot of you guys are too. Despite all of the game's faults, the frame rate, the graphical problems, this is easily the most fun I have ever had in a Pokemon game. And I think this might be my favorite of them all. And this is the first Pokemon game to ever have me sobbing at the story. No spoilers, but the Titan story really got to me. So seeing as there are so many of you playing this game, I thought today I would do my tips and tricks and things I wish I knew sooner in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. This video is mainly aimed at beginner Pokemon players or people who have returned to the franchise after a long break. And for the most part, other than a few Pokemon that may not have been officially announced, this guide is going to remain pretty spoiler free. So if you haven't got the game yet because you're waiting for it for Christmas, or you're still super early on in the story, there won't be any spoilers and we're going to be covering things from the controls all the way to how to shiny hunt. But before we get into it, make sure you subscribe to the channel down below to keep up to date in all things new and cozy on the Nintendo Switch. So there's three storylines to the game. We have the Team Star bases, the gyms, and also the Titans. And if you're anything like me, all you were feeling at the start of the game is overwhelmed. So if you're wondering what you should do first, just know that not all the story elements are worth the same. From what I've seen so far, other than progressing the story, which is half decent to be honest, defeating the star bases offers little else. But the gyms and the titans will help you on your journey greatly. Every gym that you defeat will up the level of Pokemon that will listen to you in battle and also make higher Pokemon easier to catch. It starts at level 25 for the first gym and goes up from there. So the way this works is it's based on what level the Pokemon was when you caught it. Meaning that if you had a Pokemon that you caught at a low level and leveled it up over level 25 by yourself that pokemon will not be affected but if you went and caught a pokemon over level 25 or got traded a pokemon over that level they will not listen to you until you've got a gym badge this is basically to stop you going and catching one level 50 pokemon right at the start of the game and breezing through three quarters of it so the real benefit you're probably looking at is the fact that it makes it easier to catch Pokemon of a higher level. The Titan storyline actually upgrades your legendary Pokemon that you ride with a load of new skills. These skills are something you're going to need if you want to be able to explore every inch of the map. The other important thing to know about the story is that the battles don't scale in difficulty. This means that they will always be the same level no matter what level you are at. So although the game doesn't say it, there's definitely a sort of order you want to do things in that goes from easiest to hardest. Now, obviously, these aren't set in stone and I've seen a few different versions, but most of them seem to start at either tackling the bug or grass gyms first and then going for the stony cliff titan. The easiest star base to tackle first is the dark squad base, although I did go for the fire base first and I was absolutely fine. I'll leave a list up here of the suggested order of everything to go through in case you're someone like me who just kind of needs someone else to make the decision for them. Speaking of battling other Pokemon, let's go into everything you need to know about that. You probably already know that Pokemon have types associated to them and if not you can just go in the Pokedex and have a look. When you attack another Pokemon each move can either be effective which does the exact damage it says it will do, super effective which does double damage, not very effective which does half the damage, or no effect at all, which does zero damage. This is commonly seen when you attack ghost-like Pokemon. Now, some move typings really make sense. Like, for example, electricity being super effective against water. It makes sense, but many of them don't. Thankfully, some amazing people on the internet have made us a type chart, which you can use to figure out what's super effective against every single typing. So let's say you've decided you're going to go up against the grass type gym leader first. For this, you're going to read the chart downwards. And from that, you'll see that fire, ice, poison, flying and bug are all super effective against grass. You can also see that water, grass, electric and ground Pokemon are not very effective. That means you don't want to use those typings, but you do want to use something like fire and ice. I genuinely just save that chart to my phone and then whenever I go into a battle, I just look at it, pick out my team like that and then off I go. Next, let's cover the map, the menu and the controls. The Pokedex is such a huge improvement from previous games as it actually feels like you're accomplishing something getting a new Pokemon. But what you might have missed is there's actually achievements for reaching certain milestones of Pokemon recorded. 
And the rewards are actually really good, especially in the early game where you can get your hands on Ultra Balls super fast. To access the achievements, or as some call them the Battle Pass, all you need to do while you're on this screen is press X and it will come up with all the milestones and automatically collect them as you go along. But if that doesn't compel you to finish the Pokedex, then this might. When you completely finish it and you go over to the biology classroom, you'll be given the shiny charm. This doubles your base odds of getting a shiny. So in my opinion, definitely worth the hard work. Right, next up is the map and you can see both landmarks, which are commonly the giant towers that you can see in the game, and also Pokemon centers can be fast traveled to once you've been there before. The game also has zero full damage, so it's also a lot of fun to just yeet yourself off of a tower. If you're someone like me and you find yourself constantly confused at the map orientation changing whenever you change direction, then you can press down on the right stick and it will always orientate it so that north is facing upwards. This was an absolute game changer for me. Also, if you set a way marker on the map, then whenever you exit the map, it will always point you in the direction of the way marker, so you know you just have to run straight forwards. Now, it's quite easy to run into an area where you are definitely underleveled. The best way to check this, though, is to use the left trigger to hone in on one Pokemon so you can see its name and also its level. Also, fun fact, if you're looking for a Ditto, this is really useful as it will actually say Ditto instead of the name of the Pokemon it's transformed into. And just remember, if you get stuck in a battle with a really high level Pokemon that you can't just escape from, make sure to check in your pockets to see if you have a Poke Doll, because this really helps your chances to escape. Now, the other thing I want to point out from the menu is the online modes. To do this, you press X and then go on the Poke Hub. And just a note, by default, you will not be connected to the internet. So if you want to trade with other people across the world, just make sure you press that button, connect to the internet, and then go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Next, let's cover the controls. The first most important setting you will want to go and turn on is the fast text speed. It honestly makes such a difference when you're getting through the dialogue and makes things so much easier. When you're exploring the world, you can also press in on the right stick to zoom in and out of the map. This is super useful to be able to zoom in when you're shiny hunting because some of the Pokemon are literally one pixel large. Pressing the R button will let you use the let's go feature. This is where you let your Pokemon loose and they can either pick up items or go and attack Pokemon and level themselves up. But the thing that really shocked me the most was the fact that when you did the let's go feature it wouldn't just go and KO one Pokemon. No. Your Pokemon goes and devours everything in its path. It was low-key traumatizing the first time I saw it. So if you don't want them to go and KO everything, make sure you use the right trigger to call them back. And you can use the left trigger to aim before you yeet your Pokemon out of the ball. One thing I've noticed though, if you want them to just go and attack that Pokemon straight away, you need to wait until you see the Pokemon's name and level pop up before you then throw your Pokemon. The other really cool thing about the Let's Go feature is apparently, I haven't actually found a shiny, so I can't confirm this, but apparently it will not KO shiny Pokemon. So if you watch your Pokemon refuse to fight a certain Pokemon, it might be worth running into them just to see if they're a shiny or not. Also, just to note, some Pokemon like the Wigglets will require you to need to sneak up on them. To do this, you need to press the B button and then you're going to want to sneak up, get a good distance towards them, aim your Pokemon using the left trigger and then yeet the Pokemon to catch them off guard. The final thing is about the fact that you can help your Pokemon relearn old moves. If you're anything like me, then you've been spamming the B button a lot to get through the level up dialogue and you might have missed the occasional new move that your Pokemon wants to learn. Thankfully, it's super simple to go in and relearn them so you really don't have to worry whatsoever. On to my next tip which is fight everything and everyone. There's a few reasons for this. Number one, if you're finishing the Pokedex or shiny hunting, you will most likely be broke. Pokeballs are expensive and so is ingredients to make sandwiches to increase your eggs or shiny chances. So the best way to make money is to fight trainers. Also, in each area, there's a dude who stands by the poker centers and gives you a prize for defeating everyone in the area. Oh, and by the way, speaking of money, sell the treasures. There's a treasure tab in your inventory that you most likely filled up by finding the Pokeballs or finding items from the sparkling patches in the ground. They literally do nothing other than sell for money, so don't feel bad about eating that entire tab. The next tip is to go to your classes. 
you're at school you need to still go to school you know you're living your best life i get it but you also still need to go do your classes doing classes will boost your friendship with the teachers and give you useful rewards the classes can also be pretty useful as they cover some core game mechanics that the beginning tutorial of the game doesn't really touch on also the teachers are really hot so that's another reason to go to school <laughs> Now let's move on to raid dens. As you wander around, you'll come across these glowing crystals that are raid dens. This is where four of you have a limited amount of time to defeat a terrestrialized Pokemon. Either you can do this online with three other real players, or you can do this offline and it will fill up everyone else with NPCs. How hard the Pokemon is, is determined by how many stars the raid den is. At the moment, you can unlock up to a six star raid den with a seven star Charizard event happening early and mid December. To get access to a four star raid, you're going to need to have gotten eight badges. You get five star raids after you see the credits for the first time, and you get six star raids after the post game story. Raid dens are not just useful for getting rare terror types, though, they're also super useful for getting items such as XP candy and are generally quite a lot of fun. And if this is anything like Sword and Shield, I'll end up doing so many raids that I have enough candy to level up whichever Pokemon I choose. <laughs> right now, there's actually an Eevee event happening until midnight GMT on November 27th. During this event, Eevee will be appearing more frequently in the Terror Raid battles and they'll have various terror types to go along with them. The EVs will be anything from one to five stars, so you really don't have to worry about not being far enough through the story to join in. But just know if you want to join in online with other real people, you will need Nintendo Switch online. If you're wondering what level you need to be to join each star raid battle, here is a general guide. In general, you will want to bring a Pokemon to the raid that is super effective against the terrestrialized Pokemon, but you need to also make sure that it's not weak to the typing of the Terra Pokemon as well. As you can see from the chart, if you want to join a five star raid, which is the maximum of the Eevee event, you will need a Pokemon level 80 to 90. So just bear that in mind before you go into the raid dens. Next, let's cover sandwiches. This is one of my favorite mechanics in the game, not because of what it adds, but more the whole experience. It's just so cute seeing your Pokemon run around. You can even put a ball out and they can play with it and you can wash your Pokemon. What more do you need? The whole thing is perfect. And not only are they fun, sandwiches are kind of the meta. As you progress in the game, you can get better ingredients that give even higher level effects. And you can do cool things like increasing the number of eggs a Pokemon makes, or even increase your shiny chances. One easy way to get sandwich ingredients is that you can speak to NPCs who are doing picnics out in the wild. Not only do they heal you in that instance, they'll also give you ingredients to use in your own sandwiches. One thing I didn't figure out until recently though is if an ingredient falls off the sandwich, it won't count towards the effect or make the sandwich that you selected from the recipe. Instead, it will say you've made your own concoction. So just be super careful when you're trying to make a tower sandwich like I've sometimes done. If you're wondering the best way to get sandwich recipes, then that is to go to these red sandwich shops you find in some of the towns. And then go up to the guy next to the counter and he tends to be the one that gives you new recipes. Another option is to run back to your mum as well as she will also give you more recipes. Now it's time for everything you need to know about Pokemon. Not all Pokemon need to be leveled to be evolved. Some Pokemon it's pretty simple and they'll only need a certain item. Like for example, like some of the evolutions like Flareon needs a Firestone. And some Pokemon will need to be traded to be evolved. Don't worry if you don't have a Nintendo Switch online, you can find an in real life friend to go trade with them. It'll work just the same. There's other Pokemon that can only evolve if they're a certain gender or at a certain friendship level with you. And there's even a Pokemon that will only evolve if you're online playing with friends. There's also some incredibly fun evolution mechanics added in this game. Not to spoil all of them, but one of my favorites is Pormo. In order to evolve it, it needs to do 1000 steps via the Let's Go mechanic. And also Tandem Mouse, which after level 25 will just kind of evolve off screen. You also have Gimmagool, or as I like to call it, the budget Niffler. For this Pokemon to evolve, you will need to collect 999 coins. There are two ways to get coins. You can either KO the Gimmagools you find in the chest form after you've caught your first one, or you can find wild roaming form ones on your journey. These are basically like Breath of the Wild Koroks. You'll know if you're near one though, because you can actually hear it and they're definitely worth picking up as you go along. I'll leave a link to a guide down below on all the Pokemon that need something more than just leveling to evolve. 
Next up is everything you need to know about shiny Pokemon. Shinies, for those who don't know, are basically Pokemon that are a different color. And that's it. Some of them have amazing shinies, like Lechonk that goes from being a black pig to a pink pig. And some are terrible shinies, like Sprigatito that goes from being green to being a slightly different shade of green. But the reason so many of us love hunting them is that they're super rare and they're just really fun to collect. Also, for me personally, it's a great way to add extra longevity to the game and really increase its lifespan from maybe 60 hours to completing the story to literally hundreds, if not thousands of hours to get as many shiny Pokemon as I can. The thing you need to bear in mind from every previous Pokemon game you've ever played is that Scarlet and Violet really does do things a little differently. First up, we're going to cover overworld shiny hunting. This has changed from previous games as when the shiny Pokemon spawns in the overworld, there is no sparkle and no sound whatsoever. The only way to know for sure if it's a shiny Pokemon is to encounter it and then you'll see the sparkles. I'm personally not the biggest fan of this. I kind of see it more as an accessibility issue than a cool addition to the game and I really hope they bring it back or at least a toggle, an option to bring it back in the future. But as it is right now, it's up to you to spot that the Pokemon is a different color from what it normally is. Now, if you enjoyed Pokemon Legends Arceus, you'll be happy to know that mass outbreaks are back. Kinda, they're not quite the same. For those who don't know, this is where a huge amount of the same Pokemon spawn in one location. You'll know if they're happening as a little pop-up on the side of the screen says there's mass outbreaks occurring. And if you make your way over to the map and zoom in once from the full map view, you'll be able to scroll across the map and they kind of appear like this on the map. Or if you haven't already recorded this Pokemon in the Pokedex, they'll look like this symbol instead. And hunting during outbreaks gives you kind of good odds. The base rate of finding a shiny normally in the entire game is one out of 4,096. This is with no shiny charm and no sandwich perks. If you clear 30 to 59 Pokemon by either KOing them or capturing them, this will now give you a 1 in 2048 shiny chance. But if you clear 60 or more Pokemon, you will now have a 1 in 1365 chance. The best way to know how many you've cleared is unfortunately to count. And the Let's Go feature is going to be your best friend when clearing the Pokemon. The Let's Go feature uses Pokemon typings and levels to decide who wins the battle. So make sure you use a Pokemon that's super effective against the outbreak and a high level Pokemon. If however you're not sure about how many you've counted, there will be a pop up on the side that says the outbreak numbers are dwindling and this normally means you have in fact cleared over 60. There are a few ways you can even further increase your chances though. The first one is to make a sparkling power sandwich. It's worth noting though that the ingredients you need will only be accessible when you finish the game. But there are some very smart Pokemon people out there who have already devised a pretty good method to shiny hunting during outbreaks. This is called the picnic method. Once you've either cleared 30 Pokemon or 60 Pokemon, whichever you want to do, you want to open a picnic and close it again. It's that simple. When you open a picnic, it despawns all the Pokemon in the area. Then when you exit the picnic, all the Pokemon spawn again, but these are brand new spawns and not the same Pokemon you had before effectively re-rolling every Pokemon in the outbreak every single time you open a picnic. So you basically just repeat this until you see a shiny. One thing I noticed when doing this method is that it's a little quicker to load if you don't have a full party of Pokemon. So just keep the essential one or two you might need when you encounter a shiny. You can also obviously not do the outbreak method and just kind of run around and stare at Pokemon until a shiny pops up. But there is a final way to shiny hunt and that's via eggs. I absolutely hate this method, but it is your only choice when you either want to get a shiny starter or a shiny exclusive from the other game. As I said earlier, your base odds are around 1 in 4096. Or if you do something I'm about to explain called the Masuda method, your eggs will have a 1 in 683 chance of being shiny. And that's without the shiny charm and without the shiny sandwich effects. To do the Masuda method, you need to breed a compatible Pokemon from two different real life regions. To put it simply, you need a ditto from a different language than your own to breed with the Pokemon you want an egg with. From what I've seen, the language is determined from your Switch and not what language you choose to put the game in. For example, I've been trying for a shiny Fuecoco, 
This means I need to breed my Fue Coco with something like a Japanese Ditto, and this will give me Fue Coco eggs. To get a foreign ditto, you can either join my Discord, which I'll leave to the link down below, or you can use something called the Ditto Hotline. The code for this is 44484448, and basically this is a ditto exchange. So you'll need to have caught a ditto to be able to exchange it for hopefully another language ditto. In order to get eggs from your Pokemon, you will need to throw a picnic. Now you need to make sure that when you throw the picnic that you only have a ditto and the Pokemon you want a shiny egg of in your party. Dittos be wild and you don't want to give the ditto any choices, okay? In order to collect the eggs, you need to just check the basket. The basket itself can only hold 10 eggs at a time, but there's no limit to how many eggs you can get per picnic. So just remember to look frequently in the basket and collect them. You can also eat food with something called egg power. This will decrease the amount of time it takes to make an egg. You can also press right on the D-pad to see how much longer you have left of each of the effects. Once you've collected all the eggs you want, then you need to move on to hatching them. This is super simple. You just need to put them in your party and run around. You can either run by foot or on your legendary. Either of them counts. And if you have a Pokemon with flame body, the hatching time can be reduced further. The only thing that sucks with this method is there's no way to mass release Pokemon all at once, which means I have many 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 boxes of fue coco at the moment but thankfully the number of storage boxes you have increases as you catch more pokemon i don't know when it ends or if there even is an end but at this rate i'll find out soon those are all of my best tips and tricks for pokemon scarlet and violet let me know any of yours in the comments down below and if you want to see all the games i'm looking forward to in december click here i'll see you next time bye